So thank you for hosting me today. Um, I'll take just hopefully 12, 13, 14, 15 minutes to just give a brief overview of what Defense for Children International Palestine is, what we do, and the issues that we focus on. Um, and then we can leave a bit of time for questions. So I'm Brad Parker. Uh, I'm a US trained attorney. I work with Defense for Children International Palestine. I'm based both in Ramallah and New York. Uh, DCI Palestine is affiliated with the international movement Defense for Children International. We are one of over 50 national sections as part of the DCI movement. We are completely autonomous, independent. Um, we are a local Palestinian human rights organization. Uh, I'm the only uh, international employee that DCI Palestine has. <coughs> I focus specifically on UN mechanisms, uh, making sure that our human rights documentation gets into uh, different campaigns, whether it's civil society, um, local organizing and communities throughout the world uh, that are interested in Palestinian rights. So DCI Palestine started in 1991 as a legal aid organization, uh, providing legal aid to Palestinian children charged in Israeli military courts. Uh, we, we still continue that program today. Uh, it's one of the, the main programs that we have. We also have expanded to provide legal aid to Palestinian children charged in the Palestinian Authority system. Um, we, we have a monitoring and documentation unit that monitors violence against children, anything related to violence against children in armed conflict. Um, so we have documentation on Operation Castled, uh, Operation Pillar of Defense, any military offensives in between uh, on either side over the past about 13 years. Um, we monitor and document human rights violations throughout East Jerusalem, West Bank, and Gaza, uh, whether it's the, the Israeli military, uh, Israeli settlers, uh, whoever the perpetrator is. We document those cases against children uh, and seek accountability through the various mechanisms that uh, exist in order to try to do that. If anybody has questions uh, you know, about the specifics of, of that documentation, uh, I'm glad to talk with you after, answer questions about it. Today, I, I'd really like to just focus on the issue of uh, ill treatment and torture, Palestinian children in the Israeli military detention system, because that is one of our uh, more robust issues uh, of documentation. Um, and we provide legal aid to these children that are charged in the courts. <clears throat> so every year around 500 to 700 Palestinian kids are arrested by the Israeli army uh, in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, charged in Israeli military courts. The military court system, uh, the military law applies to all Palestinians living in the occupied territory. The, if you're an Israeli settler living in the West Bank or East Jerusalem, this law does not apply to you. So the military law, the legal framework, starts out at a basis of really pure, basic discrimination. Um, it's two separate law legal systems for, for two different people um, based on your identity. It doesn't matter. So military law applies to anybody 12 years uh, and older. Um, so Palestinian children, men, women, are all prosecuted in Israeli military courts. You have Israeli military law, including specific uh, security provisions, security offenses that include uh, stone throwing, uh, violence against a soldier, violence against a civilian, property damage, all the different types of things uh, that you would think would be included in a traditional criminal code uh, with one exception. Right? Throwing stones is a specific charge under the military law. So you, you throw a stone at a military installation, something that, like the, the separation wall. Um, potential maximum sentence under Israeli military law is 10 years. If you throw a stone at a moving object, a car, uh, a military vehicle, a possible maximum sentence under military law is 20 years. <coughs> There's some variation uh, with the sentencing when it comes to children, uh, but if you're 16 or 17, you can be sentenced as an adult. If you're 12 to 13, there's a maximum uh, sentence under military law of six months, and if you're 14 to 15, that, that maximum sentence is one year. But if you commit 
or charged with an offense that carries a maximum sentence above five years, that one year limit disappears and you can be essentially sentenced as an adult. So within the structural process and the, the legal framework, there are huge issues that we work on to try to rectify. Um, ultimately, we demand the end to the military court system, the military law system. Um, but in the meantime, we also recommend specific changes to the military law in order to uh, enhance protections for Palestinian children that are arrested and charged in that system. <clears throat> so one of the main recommendations we have is an end to night arrests. So Israeli uh, military uh, arrests about 56, 50 to 60 percent of Palestinian children each year from their homes in the middle of the night between 12, 12 or midnight and, and 5 a.m. Night raids usually are uh, entail heavily armed soldiers banging on the door in the middle of the night, uh, storming the the home, um, the apartment, wherever it is, waking people up, asking for IDs. Um, if you're a 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year old boy, uh, you will most likely be targeted for an arrest. Um, maybe they have information on you. Maybe they don't. Uh, maybe one of your friends was arrested three months before, uh, and during an interrogation, he provided your name to the interrogator, and that's used to, to justify an arrest. Palestinian kids can be arrested under military law without warrants, so there's really no oversight over arrest. Uh, there's no independent <coughs> judge, uh, military official, anyone uh, that, that, that oversees the, the, the justification for an arrest. So a soldier under military law can arrest anybody that they suspect has violated one of the security offenses. And it's as simple as that. There's really no evidence that needs to be provided to, to anyone to allow that to move forward. It can just happen. <clears throat> Once children are arrested, they're blindfolded, their hands are tied, usually behind their back with a, a single plastic cord. Uh, it's usually, based on our documentation, kids generally report that very tight and painful, and that they'll wear those those uh, restraints for several hours, uh, up to maybe 12 hours, depending on the situation. To give a sense of the timing, if you're arrested, say, at 2 a.m. from your home, you'll probably be taken downstairs, blindfolded, hand-tied, uh, within the first 15, 20, 20 minutes. Maybe, maybe forced to, to wait outside in a Jeep. Um, until other arrests are conducted, people are put into the Jeep with you. And during your transfer to a military camp, you might arrive at that military camp an hour, two hours later, so it's about 5 a.m. You're still blindfolded, your hands are still tied, and you've probably been, uh, suffered some form of physical abuse during the arrest or the transfer. Uh, based on the cases that we document, uh, about 75% of kids experience some form of physical violence during the arrest, transfer, interrogation. Uh, and that ill treatment happens generally within the first 24 to 48 hours after an arrest. And this is before a child's had access to counsel. Um, their parents aren't told where they're being taken. Um, for many kids, it's the first time that they, they've been away from the home without their family, um, particularly for overnight, and they are sitting in a military camp outside, bound and blindfolded, or possibly in a West Bank uh, detention facility or a police station inside of a settlement, uh, waiting for questioning. <clears throat> so, as I said, 24 to 48 hours after an arrest, this is where the ill treatment happens. Kids brought into an interrogation room, uh, trained military interrogator, police interrogator, not informed of the right to silence, not provided access to counsel, not informed that they could have access to counsel. Uh, they're generally scared. Sometimes they are injured, uh, bruised, bleeding. Uh, depending on the cases, there's clear documentation and evidence of torture. Generally, it's, it's hitting, kicking, punching, uh, verbal abuse, slapping, we have cases, kids being hit with uh, helmets, kids being hit with the stock of a rifle, uh, and all of that happens really during the arrest and transfer. 
interrogations tend to be psychologically coercive. Um, the physical violence in inter during interrogations has, has really diminished over the past probably four or five years. Um, and what you see is, is more manipulative types of conduct. So you have shouting, you have intimidation um, on behalf of the, the interrogators. You have other children's statements being used to coerce a confession from the child that that interrogator is, is interrogating. Um, and as I said before, if you have a friend that has been arrested two, three months prior, if you, depending on the community you're from, you probably think the next time that the Israeli military comes in uh, that you may be on their list. And if you are arrested, you're likely to be confronted with your friend's statement against you during interrogation. Communities that are most affected tend to be near the separation wall, uh, near military camps, near uh, settlements, uh, near roads used by Israeli soldiers or settlers. Really anywhere where there is a settler presence or a military presence, these are the communities that, that really bear the brunt of the arrests. Uh, in addition to the villages that have weekly protests. Um, they're really, based on our information, our documentation, you, you do see specific communities targeted, um, and within those communities you see adolescent boys as the targets, um, as both of a tool of the occupation, um, but also as an intelligence gathering mechanism uh, as part of the occupation. So what we do, we provide legal aid to the children uh, that, that are um, charged in the military courts. We provide legal aid to probably uh, between 25 and 35 percent of the total cases each year. Uh, and really there's not much you can do as an attorney in the Israeli military court system. Uh, you're working with generally coerced confessions that aren't excluded. You're working with statements from soldiers that are rarely excluded by a military court judge. Um, you have a child that has confessed uh, during an interrogation where he didn't have the right to counsel, wasn't informed of his right to silence. Really all the basic due process guarantees that you would expect in a ju judicial system, a criminal justice system, don't exist. Uh, and the military court system isn't a justice system. Right? It's, it's part of an occupation. It's part of a framework that controls a particular piece of the occupation or the, the population. So um, you don't have really any grounds to challenge much of the evidence that's presented there. So what we have found is that as a child rights organization, we are the only Palestinian child rights organization, uh, that, uh, uh, the only local Palestinian human rights organization that focuses specifically <coughs> on children's rights. So there's other organizations that do provide legal aid in the military courts, but we are the only one that provides it specifically for children. And so what we notice is that the kids that we represent, they plead guilty because it's the fastest way to get them out of that system, whether they've done something or not. Uh, where information and evidence isn't excluded, uh, it's really the only system, uh, they, the only way to get the child out of the system. And with those plea agreements, we notice that as an organization that specifically focuses on children, we've dramatically reduced the, the time that children serve uh, as part of their sentence or as their plea agreement compared to other, um, whether it's private attorneys or organizations that focus specifically on on, uh, on the general people charged in the military courts. Um, and what we find that works the best is our focus on children, uh, but also highlighting the the really basic issues that exist within the military court system. Right? The, the military court system isn't broken. It's not an issue of capacity. It's working exactly the way it's intended to work. Um, the rights that are denied are intended to not exist. So we need to raise international pressure, work with uh, as many people as possible to really highlight those issues, whether it's access to counsel, uh, whether it's 75% you know, of kids are ill-treated within the system, 
um, to put pressure on the Israeli authorities uh, to implement policy changes that, that do, in fact, protect children. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I think I took a little bit more time, but... <coughs> So okay. thank you for this very compelling and comprehensive presentation. Also, Saturdays are morning, say the truth, because when your feet come stick down to reality, you realize there are people who are extremely unfortunate. We now will have five minutes for any questions you may have. So whoever would like to take the floor, just raise your hand, and we can take the questions together. Uh, thank you for convening this meeting, Mr. Chair, and I wish to thank you for your briefing on behalf of uh, Defense for Children International Palestine. I am speaking on behalf of the State of Palestine. Uh, as uh, Bernard said, your your briefing is, was very compelling and, and revealing as to the extent of the, the difficulties uh, and the trauma that is faced by Palestinian children in, under the situation of occupation and the practices that they have to endure from uh, the moment that they are apprehended in the middle of the night or in any other situation throughout the interrogation and detention period. Um, so I wanted to ask just a few questions uh, in that connection. Um, the first is, how does Defense for Children International receive information about children that are detained by, by the Israeli occupying forces in order to begin your advocacy for each specific child and in order to provide the necessary support to parents? I mean, is there a process or is this um, community, if the communities have a connection and inform you and, and what is the time frame? Um, my second question is, in, in your monitoring of the, the situations of detention, does Defense for Children International have actual access to the child, prisoners and detainees, and do you also provide, um, aside from just legal advocacy, psychosocial support for these children, or are you partnering with other NGOs to do that? Because I know, for example, that World Vision has begun a program where they are trying to provide support to Palestinian child detainees. So is there sort of a division of, of labor in that regard? And then my last question is, in the case of a guilty plea by a child, which you mentioned is the most common outcome in these situations in order to, to get them out of detention as soon as possible, um, what happens in terms of a so-called imprisonment record for the child with the occupation? With, with the occupying power, and have you found that there is repeated detention and interrogation of these same children? Do they become part of this detention and imprisonment system? Thank you. Okay, so thank you for your questions. There are great questions because it gives me an opportunity to highlight <laughs> things that, that I left out of the, the short briefing. Um, so how do we receive our info and our documentation? We have lawyers that work in both military courts. So there's a court uh, near Ramallah and there's a court in the north outside of Jenin. And we have attorneys that work there and they've worked there for, for many years and they're DCI Palestine staff. <clears throat> so when children are brought in, so a child's arrested. Um, he essentially disappears for 24, 48 hours until he, he appears in a military court. Uh, our attorneys are there. Um, they have good relationships with, with the judges and, uh, and the military prosecutors and, and other defense counsel. Um, and so when a child's brought in, it, 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 there's more of an informal kind of referral process. Um, if, if our DCI attorney isn't in the courtroom at that time, um, he'll be contacted by someone usually within that network to, to provide representation or to come to the court. Um, but generally, most of our cases come because our attorneys work in the courts. They're there when children are brought in, um, and they're, they represent them from that time and that initial hearing, and then um, they're in touch with their families to see if that representation will continue based on what the family desires. So that's, that's the, 
you know, for where we get our cases, that's the, the primary way. There's also community networks. Um, we've, we have a network of, uh, I think, about 15 field workers that work throughout the West Bank. They are members of their own communities, so when an arrest happens, a night raid happens, uh, people know that that person works for Defense for Children International Palestine, that we have attorneys that represent kids in the military courts, and in that word of mouth type uh, process also brings in cases for us. Uh, and then through that legal representation, we take sworn affidavits, we take photos of injuries that children may have uh, when they're brought to the military court, we do prison visits, and we do have access to the kids when they are being detained. Um, and, and that's generally the process of how we collect the documentation, how we collect the affidavits, how I know uh, that we, you know, 75% of these kids <coughs> encounter some form of physical violence uh, during their arrest and transfer. <coughs> uh, regarding psychosocial and other types of um, referral mechanisms, we work closely with the YMCA uh, rehabilitation program that operates uh, throughout, throughout the West Bank to a limited degree. Um, and also in East Jerusalem, we, we work with uh, communities. We also we have a community mobilization program that works in particular communities that are most affected by uh, whether it's school violence, settler violence, uh, arrests, whatever the issue might be, child labor, child exploitation, um, and work with local organizations there to, to really both build their capacity to, to understand children's rights, but also to, to make connections for people uh, for the particular issues that their children might need, whether it's psychosocial support after an arrest um, or other issues related to trauma that they face, um, whether it's during an arrest or there's some type of other violence that, that's happened in their life. So with guilty pleas, uh, they, so internationally, there's an understanding that 18 is the age of majority, um, commit a crime when you're 16, 17, you may have the ability to have that record expunged so that when you turn 18, uh, you kind of start free. Uh, that does not happen. If you are a 17 year old, 16 year old Palestinian boy, uh, you are charged in the military court, you uh, come to a plea agreement that's accepted uh, by the military prosecutor and the judge, really that that stays with you. Um, that impacts your freedom of movement, impacts a lot of other issues moving forward um, as you go on with your life. We do have cases of kids, you know, particularly in, in different villages that have weekly protests uh, that, that are impacted by settler attacks uh, quite regularly, where repeated arrests do happen. Uh, repeated abuse does happen. Um, it's very, the arrests, the violence, it's, it's very local. I think based on our documentation, if you look at the West Bank, um, you see specific areas where things happen all the time and other areas where it doesn't. So in Ramallah, there's not many kids being arrested. Uh, but if you go to Azun, um, if you go to some of the smaller villages around Nablus, uh, where you have an, a, a high Israeli settler presence, uh, you have specific communities that are targeted and, and this happens on a regular basis. Uh, maybe a weekly basis, um, and some of those same kids are arrested uh, so, uh, a few times. Um, so it's a problem. It, it's very much, from what we see, uh, targeting, and it, 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 the only way to stop it is really to improve protections in the military court, improve a process uh, with arrest, and ultimately dismantle the military law system and the military court system so that uh, Children can't just be taken out of their homes, disappeared essentially, uh, and run through a military process, a military law process that provides really zero protections. Thank you, Brad. We have two further questions. We'll start from the OIC. Thank you. Thank you for this very good presentation. And I have just a question about a few. Um, provide any legal uh, uh, services to uh, uh, those kids after they're being released. What prompted me to, uh, to ask this question, I remember when I was arrested several decades ago when I was a kid, 
and I was sentenced to 30 months. Uh, my peers who were, who were with me at the same time were sentenced to 24 months, and when the, uh, my lawyer wanted to argue with the judge, he's just a kid, he just told him, because he's a kid, he will get six more months to get a harsh lesson in his life. After being released, I went to high school and got an acceptance at American University. And when I attempted to leave the country, I was not able. So I went to the commander, the military commander. Uh, the sentence that he told me that you are not able to travel outside the country because you had a mission to liberate Palestine. When you finish your mission, you can leave and study outside the country. Uh, do you, at that time, we did not have any legal assistance from any uh, kind of organization that could help us uh, get the, the, the possibility to, uh, to remove the punishment after being arrested. Do, do, do you provide such legal assistance to, to those people? So we work, uh, we work primarily on appeals, right? So a child, uh, if you're sentenced to 30 months, 24 months, um, try to have that reduced in some way. Um, if it's a plea agreement, we usually delay agreeing to it until we can try to have it reduced as much as possible. Um, for other issues, such as you know, traveling outside of the country, um, permission to travel, it comes up in a limited number of cases because the kids that we represent, uh, you know, they're anywhere from 12 to, to 17. Um, some of them may not have the ability to to go to school somewhere else. The the family doesn't have the resources. They don't have the scholarship. It, it just it's not. It doesn't happen. Um, but I know in the past, I think about four years ago, there was a case that that we worked to to get a travel permit. Um, I can't remember. I know it comes up with cases in Gaza every once in a while, but not in the detention context. Just in the medical context. Of the, um, but yes, we do. Uh, we we don't. We, we don't just work with kids in the uh, the initial phase. We do follow those cases and uh, cases where they have younger brothers, younger siblings. Um, families usually stay in touch, and if there's something that comes up with that, we, we do help with that. So. Thank you. We have the last question will be from the gentleman there. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for convening this meeting. And I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Brad Parker for this important uh, briefing you just provide. Uh, very specific questions. What are the major challenges you are facing on the ground, on the field, in order to uh, achieve uh, results, positive results? I believe that this is a very challenging uh, task you have. And how effective are you doing regarding the facts? How effective, how efficient? And uh, do you think that the international community is doing enough, or what could be necessary from all of us in order to create that awareness that I'm pretty sure many, many countries uh, are not like uh, very aware of this situation going on? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, obviously, the main challenge is the, the occupation. Uh, a military presence in these communities puts children at risk. Uh, when children have to go through checkpoints, when they have to walk past military jeeps and soldiers to go to school, um, when soldiers fire tear gas at groups of kids walking to school, uh, that's the context that these kids live in. Um, there's a specific community, Beit Umar, uh, in Hebron, that uh, is located next to a military camp, it's located next to a settlement. Kids have to, and their village is closed off, it has a military tower on the one main entrance to the village. Uh, when they go out, there's a camera watching them, uh, there's soldiers watching them. They pass through soldiers' checkpoints regularly. Uh, this is one of the communities where uh, arrest and ill treatment of kids is, is, is extremely high. Uh, you have kids being arrested multiple times. Um, so the challenge is the occupation. I mean, it's the policies of uh, policing uh, uh, specific communities, <coughs> and it's the presence of soldiers and settlers near Palestinian communities. I think, you know, we, despite the, the fact that 
ill treatment continues to be widespread and systematic. We have made progress on certain key issues that uh, hopefully are the starting point to, to having actual changes uh, that affect the practical situation for kids living in the occupied Palestinian territory. So it, the age of majority used to be 16. It's now in military law raised to 18. Uh, but uh, you know we welcome that. It's a, a good change. But you still have 16 and 17 year olds allowed to be sentenced as an adult. Um, the pretrial detention phase before a 16 or 17 year old has to be brought for, before a military judge is the same as adults. Um, so even though we have that one change, there's still other changes that uh, didn't weren't affected because of that. Um, we, one of our main issues is night arrest. Right? If you don't have uh, soldiers arresting children from their homes in the middle of the night, putting them in a jeep, blindfolding them, tying their hands behind their back, uh, if you don't put kids in that situation, you'll probably see that ill-treatment will, will be reduced. Uh, you won't have three out of four kids being ill-treated. Uh, so what we recommend is a summons process where uh, the military commander, the military prosecutor, calls the family, calls the child, says we want you to show up uh, at the police station at this settlement at this time on this date. Uh, very much the same process that they would use for an Israeli settler child uh, living in the same territory. Um, you don't have the night raids, you don't have the night arrests. Uh, it changes the situation. Um, that's recently um, partly uh, because of our advocacy, working with UNICEF on a recent report that they did last February has changed uh, at least the rhetoric around night arrests. So now there is discussion within the Israeli authorities, the military prosecutor, about implementing a summons process. They've said publicly that they want to uh, implement a pilot program for a summons process to, to try it out and see what the results are. Uh, and I think that's something that the international community can really help put pressure on to say, yeah, that's a great alternative to night raids being the default arrest pr procedure. Um, try the summons process. Because in reality, it's an occupation. It's a military occupation. Uh, they can do anything they want at any time to anybody. Uh, so if somebody doesn't appear as part of the summons process, they always have the, re re the recourse of, of doing a night arrest. Uh, really, it's don't rely on night arrest as the default. Ultimately, we want no night arrest, no military presence, but uh, this, is, this is kind of the incremental steps that we think can really make a difference, uh, and hopefully it's moving in that direction, but I think we need, you know, needs to be more than me, more than DCI, more than UNICEF. Uh, we need member states uh, to, to really push this forward. <laughs> and there's other examples too, but I'll just to be brief. <laughs> Thank you, Brad, once again for sharing this morning with us. We commend, as a working group, the very good work that Defense Fortune International is doing. And obviously, we all look forward to the day that all children are treated equally, and which would make this world a really a better place. We thank you once again for joining us.